Um, I want to now invite to the stage our panelists. I'm going to e introduce each one of you, if you'd please come on up to the stage. Um, Kim Bannerman, our MC, a 12-year veteran of the tech industry. Kim started out in consulting and moved to business development before finding her passion in the community and developer relations space. She founded the Seattle chapter of Startup Chicks and both the Atlanta and Seattle Cloud Foundry meetup groups. When she's not on an airplane, she's helping her blended family of four daughters and one son navigate through everything from coding camps to high school and college. Opal Perry. Opal Perry is the Vice President and Divisional Chief Information Officer for Claims at Allstate Insurance, where she leads a global engineering team focused on digital transformation. Opal is active in creating and enhancing diverse techno technology communities and organizations, and is also an executive sponsor of the Allstate Pride Employee Resource Group, which promotes an inclusive work environment for LGBTQ Allstate employees and their allies. A U.S. Air Force veteran, Opal and her wife Lisa currently reside in Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Kyla McMullen is a tenure-track faculty member at the University of Florida. She earned her master's and PhD degrees from the University of Michigan, where she is the first underrepresented woman to graduate with a doctorate in computer science and engineering. She is also the conference chair for the National Society of Blacks in Computing. Cornelia Davis is Senior Director of Technology at Pivotal, where she works on the technology strategy for both Pivotal and for Pivotal customers. She is an industry veteran with almost three decades of experience in image processing, scientific visualization, distributed systems and web application architectures, and cloud native platforms. Cornelia is also an activist working on achieving a better gender balance in technology related disciplines and is active with the Girls Who Code. When she's not doing these things, you can find her on a yoga mat or in her kitchen. And finally, Rachel Reinitz is an IBM fellow and CTO of IBM Bluemix Garage. The Bluemix Garages are consulting labs housed in starting communities that partner with clients of all sizes to transform how they design, develop, and deploy engaging cloud applications. She leads clients on adoption of new technologies and is currently focused on applying agile methods to building cloud applications with clients. Welcome. So, Here's what we're going to do. Each panelist. Each panelist is going to tell a little story supporting or in response to the framework. And then we're going to open it up to questions on the floor. All right, so get them ready. Kim, why don't you start? Sure. So, about five years ago, I kind of came to a crossroads in my career. I wanted off the hamster wheel of managing national sales teams to be on an airplane all the time. Funny enough, I'm still on an airplane, so it's fine. <laughs> Good thing I like to travel. Um, and I wanted to do something different. And so I sat down with a, a woman in tech friend of mine, and she said, what are your superpowers? Like, what are you talking about? She already knew. Um, and so she convinced me to apply for a position inside of her company, uh, working for a very supportive CTO um, and a great team of folks, and that was Tier 3 CenturyLink, and that's how I started this journey with Cloud Foundry. Um, but really the story I want to tell is I was always the person behind the scenes elevating other people, and I still love to do that. That's one of my favorite things, especially if you're doing great work in our community you know, and, and you're new, you, I want to I make people feel welcome, right? So I'd never really spoke at a conference before. And two things happened. I, we were, it was my first interconnect when I worked at IBM, and the CTO that I reported to said, we, what is up with this panel? It's the same people all the time. What are we doing here? And um, they said, you know what? Like, you're so right. Um, let's mix it up a little bit. Rachel spoke. Um, he put me up there, and I was like, oh, no, you don't want to put me up there. And he's like, you can do that. No, I'm serious. Like, I just got here back in October. This is, like, March. Like, I'm still kind of sort of ramping up. He's like, you got it. It's a 10-minute light and talk. You can do it. He sat down with me. He gave me his deck. We prepped speaker notes. Um, it was amazing. He really spent a ton of time with me that he didn't have on his calendar 
to get me ready for this. And I sat at the table and I went right after the OpenStack Foundation spoke and and Claude Foundry was speaking after that and Sam Ramji was sitting next to me and he said, just focus on me. He's like, I've heard you speak before. This is going to totally be fine. And he said, I know people say don't focus on someone in the audience because that's when you mess up and you forget your lines. He's like, but it'll be fine. And so that's what I did. And that was the first time I ever spoke in front of a big crowd like that, other than a close, you know, customer or something like that. And there were 17, I think 15 or 1,700 people in the room. It was insane. Um, and after that, I was like, oh, wow, okay, I can do this. This is great. Um, and I, I owe a lot to people that call themselves allies. I want to say, make sure that you're doing the work as well um, and kind of tie that off. And also, don't just lean on the diversity in your community to do all the hard work, right? I mean, those are kind of two things that can tie into these push and pull things inside of a community or a company. Um, and if, if I was not for those key people in my life in the last five years, um, there's no way I'd be doing what I really love to do right now. So, thank you. Oh, great, wonderful story. I, uh, for me, it's, it's I'm a very affiliative person, so it's all about the team. It's all about that cohesive team that's doing big things. And I've had the opportunity throughout my career and in the last six years at Allstate to be part of a number of different teams, and I love each team. You know, I've got special memories and special things we do together, but really over the last three years, I've been the most thrilled at our Composed Labs effort where we've been building lean and agile methods and labs uh, at Allstate, and I've just been, I've been so thrilled because I came into Allstate, I was recruited in as a change agent to help transform technology, and it's a big mission, and I had a lot of ideas, and was working with other people on initiatives, but after a few years, you know, you start going, I, I know we're making progress, but there's still so much more to be done. And I had some other colleagues coming in from other roles and other sides. And I, I remember when I sat down with our head of, new head of infrastructure one day to talk to him, and I was just kind of geeking out, trying to sell him on all the stuff I wanted to do around CI, CD pipelines. And he was like, oh my God, you're the first person here that's talked to me about Chef and Puppet and all these things. And then I I knew I had a kindred spirit, and as he started uh, picking up speed within the organization, and my good friend who ran the PMO came in, which is a really non-traditional thing in a lean and agile transformation, like a lot of companies talk about, you know, the PMO is going to be the last bastion of resistance to new ways of working, and she just jumped right on board, and we, we had this really diverse senior leadership team getting the support and then empowering other people throughout the enterprise to do it. And it's been thrilling to me. I was on assignment for almost two years in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and it was really meaningful to me, too, that we created a global leadership team with people from different backgrounds and skills. And it was it was doing the work together, but it's just also the organic way it started coming together to me. It's There's the all the direct work, and when you find yourself having the sidebar with people and finding commonality, or you start to realize like somebody had a really bad day or week, and then everybody's just even on a text message chain together, venting and supporting each other, or people notice you look a little down in the hallway. Like There's so many different ways it's expressed, um, but it's that real spirit of belonging, and then when you start accomplishing things as a team, the real pride to be able to see it reflected in other people, not just in yourself. So that's just really, really thrilling to me. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so there's a common theme going on here, um, very much like Opal with this sense of community and belonging. Um, my story is actually towards the very beginning of my journey when I was in high school I didn't know what I wanted to major in, but looking back, I should have known because every single toy I had was computerized. I wanted everything that had a screen. Um, but when I was in high school, every person who ever did computer science, I'm like, well, that's not me. That doesn't look like me. So, you know, in high school, I'm like, all right, well, do I have to just not have any friends? And I'm going to get a Dragon Ball Z t-shirt and just not care about my hair. And just like, I was literally in my head trying to figure out how in the world do I turn into a white boy to do this class? Like that was... <laughs> 
And that was exactly what I said to myself, if I can be candid. Um, but in the end, um, I was like, you know, I'm just going to take the class. And if I don't like it, I can switch to something else. So then there was also a new teacher who came in, Mr. Ware. And Mr. Ware was someone who had just completed his master's. So he was still very young. He was a black man who was studying computer science. And, you know, we do the warm up exercise. He could talk to us about the basketball game and then come back and we talk about logic. So and I really remember having that thought in my head, like, whoa, he is a normal person and he is doing computer science and just having that sort of depiction of a person who I didn't see as, you know, kind of being weird or eccentric because who wants to sign up for that? Right. So I wanted to just have a, a just a picture of someone who I could attain to be, even though we're two different genders. I said, you know what? He reminds me of my big brother. You know, I can see myself following in those footsteps. So um, the importance of just having someone that you can look up to whose shoes you can see yourselves in is just it, it was transformative for me. Yeah. So the first thing I have to say before I even tell my story is I just tweeted any day that you have a chance to meet Karen Holtzblatt is a really good day. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, so thank you. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting because I've been doing this for about 30 years and I um, almost never have thought about leaving because I really, 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 really love what I do. And um, I had... For the first 25 years that I was doing this, I would occasionally notice that I was the, the only woman in the room, or a, a room of 50 people. But for the most part, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. And in reflection, I, I mean, this definitely speaks to the, the belonging part. Um, it, it's to somewhat a, a bit of a reflection of the way that I grew up, because I was the kid, I was the girl who didn't care about gender when I was a kid. I was out there playing soccer with the boys. And so I actually always had a lot of male friends. And I think that that allowed me to be part of that group and not see that as a barrier. So that's certainly part of my story. But the other part of the framework that really resonates with me, um, and I thank you for this because it, it actually took a weight off my shoulders, is that I'm a woman, and am I really supposed to just be interested in socially relevant programs? Because I kind of felt bad that what really got me going was whatever cool technology problem was out there. And, and so I think that being, you've given me permission not to fit in a particular box. You've given me permission to really look at that and say, yes, in fact, I consider myself a change junkie. And so being in this technology area is the perfect place for being a, tech, a, a, a change junkie. And if you look at that table that Karen showed, the, by far and away, the, the tallest um, bar in that bar chart was learning something new. And so that really, really resonated with me. And the fact that it's the same things that motivate men in the field is just eye-opening. That's liberating. Thank you. Rachel, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, so we had talked about, I'm going to talk about family. Um, so I was progressing my career. I was a, senior, a fairly senior technical leader in IBM and heading towards the next level, which is a significant level, becoming a technical executive, a distinguished engineer. And I was at a point in my life where I was like, all right, if I want to have a child, I need to do it soon. Right? And I did not have a partner. All right. And so then it's like, all right, am I going to have a child? Am I going to do this on my own? Um, I had a great discussion with some friends of mine. And I said, you know, I don't know about doing this. And I'm worried about my career and the impact. And one of my friends said to me, he said, you know, you will gain skills that will help you in your career. I was like, really? He was absolutely right. I was an impatient person, and I am now a patient person. <laughs> according to me, according to my 12-year-old, not so much, mm -hmm. but you know, and it's amazing how at work I take care of all these things, and I'm patient, and I negotiate, and I get home, and my 12 year old is going, mm -hmm. I'm like what? <laughs> you know, it, it's it's definitely very different. So I had my I had my daughter. I did donor insemination. I was very open about it at work, um, it, including including to my senior vice president when I was up for promotion, and it was fine. It was fine. But um, to reach that next level required a lot of travel. 
you know, it required being networked, it required being known. Um, I was actually in consulting when I had my daughter uh, and doing so I also talked with my VP at the time, like I can't do the same kind of work. I traveled 75% before I had my daughter and she found me a role that was more internally facing but still in the same area, leveraging the skills I led, service oriented architecture and taking out to the field for, um, for IBM. And uh, I figured it out. And, and the company did support me. You know, we were talking about this. They, they didn't pay for the nanny or anything. But, you know, I had, I lived with my sister, so I did have a co-parent, and she would travel with me. My mother would travel with me. And, you know, some of the time it was great. You know, my daughter's been to Istanbul. My daughter's been to Madrid. You know, she can tell you that's the Ayah Sophia. You know, stuff like that. However, it's not always great, either when you go to, you know, Austin and they're in a hotel room and my daughter's sick and you have to go find a pediatrician or, you know, a jet lag kid is not a fun thing. So, you know, it's, it's trade-offs. Honestly, it's been harder more recently, you know. So with going towards IBM Fellow and just with the Bluemix Garage going worldwide, so I have nine labs throughout the world, um, it's actually become more demanding in terms of travel. Uh, and my daughter is more demanding in terms of um, being more vocal and feeling more like I'm not there enough and things like that. Um, and I have cut back on some of that. You know, again, you can ask my daughter what she thinks, but, um, and it is this, we were talking about this a little, it's a constant trade-off. There's a lot of trade-offs, right? Um, but I do feel like I am a successful parent. You know, I like, I like my daughter most of the time. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, my mother, my mother says I'm a good daughter, you know, I also have the aging parent thing and, uh, you know, they, they promoted me. So it's going okay, but there's always trade-offs. And so I guess my core message to you is everyone's path is unique and you, you are in a privileged position to start out with. You are educated. You are educated in a field that is in demand, right? You can find the companies, you can find the supportive organizations. As long as you keep developing your skills and you keep current, you will have choices. So you can make your own path and you do have to make choices along the way and decide whether you're going to have a kid and how you're going to do that. But, you know, you're in a great situation to do all kinds of terrific things. Thank you so much. So, encouraging stories, a little nearer to home. An RBG. Questions? Who's got a question? Why not? Um, I was wondering, has any of you ever considered leaving tech? And yep. would you care to share the story? <laughs> Go for it. Oh, yeah. Um, there's been points. It's funny because I was having this conversation earlier this week. I said, so I've been in tech almost, well, over 12 years. And if I had known what I shouldn't have been putting up with a long time ago when I first started out in tech, I don't think I would still be here. Um, I, I just felt like that was just how life was. And like you had to put up with these microaggressions. You have to put up with these comments. You have to put up with um, various things that happen from all different types of people. And um, we don't. Um, I wanted to leave tech about the first time I said I want to rage quit tech was about six months ago. Um, and I don't want to get into it. It was a compounding different things that were happening in, in various places of, you know, getting interrupted, you know, all these crazy things that I thought we had left behind a long time ago. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it gives me more value to be here than to leave. And that's why I stay. Somebody else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I'll chime in. I think that um, it, it's, it's been rare. Um, I will say that it's gotten harder the further I get in my career, which I, I don't think is unusual. Um, I think that there's fewer uh, people, fewer women, the further you get in your career. And so it has gotten harder. And referring back to the framework, um, it wasn't said directly, but indirectly in some of the things, it was about those stretch assignments. It was about getting the opportunity to learn that new thing and do that new thing. And that when those opportunities aren't coming, that's when I wonder at this stage of my career, am I going to get those opportunities? Is somebody going to help move me to the point where I get the next stretch goal? Because that is something that is documented and understood that women don't tend to be given the opportunities for the stretch goals as often as men. Um, and that it, it hasn't gotten to the point where I want to leave the industry, 
but it's one of those things where I wonder whether I'm going to get that opportunity to move to the next level. So I think that's something that we as an industry really need to look at, kind of sponsorship. Well, I think this is where push and support comes, right? Yep. So you can hear her. And around her, she's looking for someone to push. And what I'm hoping is if you know you need push and support, go get someone and say, I need a push. Would you please do it? Because I can't tell you it works if you do it that way. Okay, so don't give up. Remember, guys are just guys. They're your little brothers and those annoying little boys that you played with. Do not forget that's what they really like on the inside, okay? <laughs> Other questions? From our young people. <laughs> Um, so I've heard like all these horror stories of like these and like aspiring engineers and like computer scientists like that walk into college and as soon as they start taking like these math courses and all that like they like they get bored and they back out and like they have to completely like reorient their focus. So like was there any like ever a time in your like educational like part of tech like that you found to be boring yet like push past? Oh my God, yes. Mm -hmm. I took material science and my professor was a monotone. It was Friday morning and, and a friend of mine was a TA for the class and I'd see him out drinking Thursday nights like I haven't seen your homework, you know, and it was, you know, it was the worst class. I, I did the worst in it in my college career, but, you know, I did, I did pass, right? So, um, you know, there's some stuff you just got to motor through, right? You know, I mean, it's not, it's not all exciting cool. I had some great professors, like physics was awesome, you know, but that's just, I mean, that's life, no matter what you study, right? Economics was not fun either, and that wasn't a, a tech class, so. I, I had some really tough times, and probably for a variety of different reasons, and I, I think my salvation was finding networks of friends. I was on the crew team, and there was a great group that were from all different majors, and that was sort of like where I would go to my refuge when I had a, a tough time. Some of it was just the academics were really challenging. I was studying computer engineering. I had always done super well in my high school, and then you just hit this, you know, you were kind of maybe the big fish in the small pond of high school, and then I'm at university, and I'm in this really big pond of all of these people that seem to find their direction. Some of it, honestly, I was studying computer engineering, and there's one other woman who graduated in my year uh, in my class back then, and there was just even some like blatant sexism. I remember having a male lab partner, and we went to talk to our professor about what we were doing, and he like engaged with my male lab partner, and then he turned and he looked at me, and he said, well, what did you do this weekend? And it was just like, wow, this is, you know, I'm, I'm here to, like, try to absorb all this knowledge. And in addition to whatever's just challenging to me, there's someone not even willing to interface. But again, I just found my way by going and finding the groups and the supportive elements, the male and female classmates and people that just were like, no, you can do this. We can do this. Let's make it happen. And I'm so glad I persevered. But I definitely, I've never thought since I've been professionally out in the field about leaving, but um, I had some moments at university of thinking, like, is this is this what's right for me? And I've been so pleased I personally persevered. I can think of um, just one mentality you should think of. So I actually teach an intro to Java freshman 500 person sort of course. And one thing that I've noticed is that lots of people will come and they're the valedictorian, salutatorian, top 1% of their high schools, and they haven't experienced much adversity. So if you come in already saying, you know what, this is going to be a challenge and you can accept, okay, I may not be good at everything, but I have the resources, I have the skills, I can build these networks to become better at it. Because those are the students you typically see that they're very talented, but they may just fall by the wayside and drop out, as you mentioned, because they're not used to ever having anything be hard. So I would say just go in with the mentality, this is going to be hard, but guess what? You're a rubber band. You can just, you can just bounce back. Thank that's you. college in general. Yeah. Most classes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another question. Just wanted to say thank you for sharing all of your stories. It's been very helpful. And my question for you is when you do have those moments of doubt or you feel maybe I'm not good enough or maybe I'm not the best, how do you get past that? And what do you tell yourself? And how do you make it work? I... I go to people I'm close to, you know, for some of the dialogue, right? Because 
some of it's correct. I just had this happen. I have a new, you know, I'm being asked to do something, to run something that I haven't done before. And I talked with my VP about it. And I said, you know, I can do this. You know, it's not that I can't do it. But I have not done this before. And he's like, you know, we're going to get you help. And I also have some stuff going on on the personal side. And he's like, you know, you're not in it on your own. Right? And um, I have an idea. I have this like great idea I got while I'm here, and I'm gonna go talk to my best buddy Kyle, right? And I can go to Kyle and ask him all the stupid questions. There are questions that I don't really want to ask. I don't want to show that I don't know stuff sometimes, right? But with Kyle, I have 100% credibility, and he's brilliant. If he agrees with me, it's a good idea, and he'll also help me take it <laughs> forward. So it's for me. It's finding those people, and sometimes it is the self-talk that just says you can do this, you know. One of the things that it applies even more broadly than to just your question there is that sometimes, um, you know, I mentioned, they mentioned in my intro that I, I practice yoga. And one of my favorite yoga uh, instructors once said, suffering is the resistance to what is. And so when those voices, I agree with Karen, shoo them away. But at the same time, um, having a little bit of shoo it away in kind of a, okay, it's there, acknowledge that it's okay, I'm feeling bad, and don't don't stress about your, you feeling bad about yourself. Just send it on its way. It's kind of like the monkey mind, you send it on its way. And then the other thing is just telling yourself, look, I have felt like this before, and I figured it out. And you will feel like that again, and you will figure it out. And so after a while, you start to realize, Gee, every single time I feel this way, I, it's okay, acknowledge it, let it be there, but I always figure it out, and that makes it easier to send that on its way. So you will figure it out. Just uh, one of the things people like when I talk about this, self-doubt is the inner noise of trying to do something new. There's no such thing as knowing how to tango before you take a lesson. And so those beginning times, you're going to feel like you don't know how to dance. You're not in any flow. You're supposed to feel like that anytime you take up something new. I've been doing this 30 years. And when I said, I think I'll address women in tech, that's exactly how I felt. Ooh, will anyone listen to me? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean you stop. You just go, hi. Oh, I guess I'm doing something hard. Who else wants to share on that? I'm, I'm going to apologize real quick. I have a 2.30 session that I'm speaking at. <laughs> so I'm going to thank you all and excuse myself. We aren't stopping till 2.30, though, right? So what's that? Right? I mean, we're still on time, right? We have about yeah, three minutes. But I have, I'm on, right. stage. Have I'm on a different stage. stage. Yeah. Yeah. On a different yeah. stage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if I we did, want one last comment. Sorry, I did want to say one other comment. So yeah, that's definitely a feeling that you can mm -hmm. have. And aside from making sure you oh. have the positive self-talk, I actually asked my boss if I could see my letters of recommendation for my job, and they were open. And I felt so awesome. Like these people think these things about me. Like it's you know just reading, and I come back to it from time to time. So if ever you have something where people just said positive things about you, like you'll be like, I can do this. I got this. Yeah. So, he told yeah. me to make a happy file probably like yeah. six years ago and I was like what's that no all the little text messages all the little tweets all the little emails um, things like that and you just put them all in a folder and you know a cloud and you like whatever put them on a, you know, a USB drive however you want to do it and so I really thought that was a little silly. And I was like, well, why would I want to do that? I've got all these different, you know, platforms. And of course, we remember MySpace, right? That's gone. Not, I mean, it's not really, but it is. I mean, so, so I'm like, well, what if these things do go away? What if I do want to shut my account down? That's actually a pretty good idea. So I start, I kind of put it all together when I was kind of in this transition period before I, I'm on the path I'm on now. And so I just, I just add little things to the happy file. And then when I feel awful or I'm in tears or what's happening, and I just go through and I just start reading through the happy file. And I, it works. I think that's great. You guys have really great positive strategies. I need to use more of those. I, I have to admit, I've also learned in my life, like if I think I can't do something or shouldn't do something or I'm not the best person to do it and I see an opportunity, 
and then someone incompetent gets that opportunity, and I have to sit there and like be a victim of that's when you're allowed incompetence. Right? They re- <laughs> like I remember that now when I think, why me? Like, why not me? Because who else is it going to be? And to try to step into that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to mention one other thing that's kind of related, which is you need to forgive yourself when you make mistakes. Everybody screws up. Everybody says the thing they shouldn't, right? Everybody interrupts their boss at some point when they shouldn't, you know? Um, You know, there are some things that you can avoid. Uh, The thing is to learn from it and to move on and forgive yourself. And that's very important because if you're afraid of making those mistakes, you won't put yourself forward and you won't take risk, right? And it was great. I had a team member tell me that she's been really inspired because I acknowledge my mistakes to my team. I'll say, you're totally right. I got that one wrong, you know, and it's really inspired her to feel more like she can share and doesn't have to hide that maybe something didn't go the way it should, those kinds of things. Well, everybody, great panel, yes? All right. Thank you for coming. Go home, do something. Yeah? I'm expecting it. I want to see emails and things like that telling me what you tried and come up and talk to me and, you know, be part of the, be part of change. Thank you all.